guys. Hi everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. As a medical student at the Yale School of Medicine, she focused on understanding racial disparities and health outcomes. She completed her MD thesis titled At the Root of Health Disparities, the Black-White Achievement Gap. As a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, she continues to focus her research on racial disparities in transplant outcomes and post-transplant HCV care. She serves as the medical director of hepatology and also was recently appointed vice chair of diversity and inclusion for the Department of Medicine at UPMC. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Nadia Yonasan. Can you guys hear me? Can I hear me fairly well? My voice carries fairly well, so I might move down the mic just in case I'm kind of reverberating through the room. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited. I just have to um, put a disclaimer out there. I am not a health policy expert. You probably know a lot more about health policy, but I am a citizen. So I do feel like I uh, do understand some aspects of how I'm affected as a citizen. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background because I think this kind of steeps the conversation in something. I am um, one of three daughters of two immigrant parents from, uh, from Jamaica. My parents came here when they were in their 30s. They uh, never really returned. Um, my father was a teacher, a public uh, school teacher um, in Cleveland, Ohio. My mother never went to college. She worked for um, a, a large German company and then worked for PNC Bank before she retired. My sisters, um, unfortunately I lost my first sister to metastatic breast cancer two years ago. She was a phenomenal person. Went to the Wharton Business School and um, worked for probably five Fortune 50 countries. And my younger sister is actually a business person and works for Shell. So I was um, blessed enough to love medicine. I'm a transplant hepatologist, which means I take care of people before and after they uh, get liver transplanted. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you guys about this idea of what I think the importance of diversity in policy really is. So we're going to start with this idea that the diversity conversation is fairly broad. And there's no way, you know, Gladys, my dear friend, who I want to thank for inviting me, there's no way that I can, con can cover the breadth of this conversation in the 30 minutes that I'm going to have with you. But let's just presume that the conversation is broad and includes areas such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and disability. Because I belong to a racial minority, I'm going to concentrate on that particular part of the subject. And because I really am interested in racial disparities in healthcare outcomes, I'm going to concentrate on that group. In addition to that, I think it's important for us to kind of focus on a domain. And many of the hot public policies that are out there right now disproportionately affect people of color in these areas. So when we think about immigration, access to care, health care, gun violence, and criminal justice reform, these are kind of some of the areas that disproportionately affect people of color. I am going to predominantly concentrate on health care because that's really where um, I spend the majority of my time. This is probably um, not news to you. Societal diversity is our reality. So it's projected really before, probably about 2043, but definitely by 2050, that there will be no racial majority in this country. Um, and we should be pretty um, be, you know, amazed by that, because we really are now in, a, in an era of what we would call cultural pluralism. right? We are really going to have a true representation, a true melting pot in this country. I just want to start by this, because as we go through this conversation, <coughs> I think you'll understand where I am as a citizen in, dis in um, kind of discovering why in health policy, the first time I really took this on, is diversity important. So let's go from just a very, very basic concept. There is the state. And I'm going to imagine that the state is government, whether it be state, federal, or just very broadly, our policy makers. So on the one side of the screen, there are the makers. And on the other side of the screen is me, the citizen. I'm the doer. You create policies, and then I'm going to carry them out. You decide that there's going to be a Voting Rights Act, or we're going to repeal it, and I either vote or I don't vote. You decide that I need my passport or my, uh, my license or all of those other things in order to vote, and I have to do that as the citizen. What I want to suggest, and I think this is a, maybe an oversimplification of the process, is that there is something that maintains the state in a reasonable state, an equilibrium. And we need some basic things. We need law. We need order. We need civility. 
We need financial security because otherwise people will feel insecure and then there will no longer be law and order. And we need sovereignty, the ability to make our own decisions as a state, right? So I'm going to just make you the state, the audience, and I'm going to be the citizen, okay? My whole point of this talk is that we need to return to the citizen. And how do we do that? Because there are policy makers, but then there are doers. And my sister would always say, do you want to be, and I think that this is effective for marriage, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Right? <laughs> I can write, if you come into me and I have hypertension, you know, you come to me and you have hypertension, you have high blood pressure. I can write all the scripts that I want, but if I have not explained myself, explained the importance of the medication and why you should take it, have I been effective? The answer to that is no, right? You fundamentally leave, you don't take the medication because you think it's hogwash, and you still are hypertensive. So I haven't been effective. And my whole point is that as policymakers, you as the state have a role in making sure I as the doer am effective in carrying out what you think the policy was for. So my first thing is that public policy must concentrate, not maybe should concentrate, but must concentrate on the citizen. It has to be focused on the citizen because other, otherwise we're ineffective in what we do. So policy is kind of in my mind, you know, I'm kind of like, oh, public policy. You know, I kind of had to read, like, what is the history of public policy? Where am I? Public policy, policy in and of itself is essentially ineffective before, because of what I just told you. So our citizens have to be moved to do. People often talk about minority populations, the absence of voting, all of those things. I have never seen lines like I saw when President Obama went up for president, right? You would have thought something was being given out for free. And at the time, I lived in Baltimore, which is a, a city that's 65% African American. So people were waiting around blocks and buildings to vote. So again, you have to know that the doer has to be motivated to move in order for policy to be effective. And the question is, what do we as the maker owe them? What do you as the state owe them? So I'm going to take an exam example, because that's what I know, from medicine. So you guys probably know this guy, W.E.B. Du Bois. He was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Harvard University. And in 1906, he wrote something called The, Physique, the Health and the Physique of the Negro. And at that time, there was a social debate in the community about whether African Americans had poor health because of segregation and social conditions, or whether or not they had poor health secondary to biological inferiority. So in 2002, some 100 plus years later, the Institute of Medicine, which is like the highest institute in medicine, you want to be inducted into this if you're a physician, I'm not, um, <laughs> but wrote this book called Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Health. Part of the reason for this is that in, in 1998, you can see that black males have 1.6 times, they're 1.6 times more likely to die than their white male equivalents by age or any other social match. What's staggering about this is this has not changed since 1950. So we calf people, we have immunotherapy for cancer, we have Plavix, we have aspirin, we have PPIs, we have blood pressure medication, things that we wouldn't have thought of back in the 1950s. And still the most vulnerable populations in our community are still just as more likely to die. So why is that? I'm going to argue with you that if the state is not effective and not representative, then the doer can't do, okay? Part of the reason for this, and they broke this down by multiple studies in this unequal treatment book that was written, written in 2002, that when studies were done, blacks were receiving inferior care. Like blacks and Latinos were receiving inferior care. And when you look at this study by Williams in 1995, you look at ICU patients, blacks had a shorter length of stay, lower resource utilizations, and had less technological monitoring than whites did in the population, and therefore were less likely to survive these hospitalizations. Guandanola did another study in 1995, and blacks were twice as likely to get <coughs> amputations of their legs, and whites more likely to get revascularization. So you can have the tools, but again, if not effective, it doesn't affect the outcome. And then Aaron actually did a study in 2000, and you guys probably know from that huge study that came out in Pittsburgh, um, whites are more, more likely or less likely to get cesarean sections, and you all know the infant mortality in Pittsburgh um, is phenomenal. If you see that, saw that a study that came out of Pittsburgh School of Public Health, if you are a black female and you just leave the city, your life expectancy goes up. It's 2020, guys. We are having the same conversations 
that we had in 1906. So I don't know if any of you all listen to this. If you don't, you got to get the podcast, Hidden Brain. So this is a great NPR segment. And in June of 2019, they did a segment called People Like Us. And this is just, again, to reinforce this idea about the state and the citizen. So what they did essentially was they went to flea markets and they went to barber shops and they recruited black men. They took 1,300 black men, they recruited them, and they essentially randomized them to being taken care of by a black physician or randomized them to be taken care of a non-black physician. And they did anything from something that's essentially there's no real invasiveness whatsoever. You just get on a scale, get your height measured, BMI, blood pressure, get your cholesterol taken to something that was invasive. And they actually gave you incentive to do like a flu shot. So they would give you 5 to $10 of incentive. The remarkable thing, and I don't know that anybody would have known this, is that every single time, no matter whether it was from getting your weight taken and your height taken to actually getting a flu shot, which is an intervention, you're actually physically getting shot, Black males were always more likely to do that if their physician was black. And this has been studied multiple, multiple times. So again, in this particular case, the state and the citizen have racial concordance. Now, no one's going to suggest, OK, in every black city, 65% of the doctors be, you know, in Baltimore, 65% of the physicians be black. We're not suggesting that. But the question is, when people think the state is representative of their choices, what do they do? Are they effect, effectual doers? OK. So. I thought that this was very articulate, so I was reading this paper called Ethnic Diversity in Public Policy as part of this talk. And in this, Crawford Young says, essentially, we must assume that the value attached to ethnic affiliation by human communities is a natural condition, not pathologic. In some scenarios where we sit in our <coughs> own rooms or we sit in our silos and we're on Facebook listening to people with racist rhetoric and all of these you know, anti-Semitic, all of these things, right? Those, you know, xenophobic type of things, that's pathologic, right? But an affiliation to someone who looks like your mother or looks like your father or has the same religion or worships in the same place as you shouldn't be at baseline considered pathologic, right? So we have to have some presumption about that. But that also puts us in a situation where if the state doesn't look like us or doesn't represent us, how effectual can we be in our policy making? So the second point is that the state and the citizen should look similar because the affinity towards the group you belong to is natural. If you tell me, if my mother comes in or my aunt comes in or a black male comes in the room or a white male comes in the room and says something, I might be more affected by that or feeling like that's true than if somebody else that looks very different from me or has a very disposition, religious affiliation, et cetera, than would. And I'm arguing that therefore you need representation. So we get back to this idea of the state and the citizen and I ask you, if the state is a white male heterosexual from a rural area, and you happen to be a female, Hispanic, uh, lesbian from a metro area, would you want them making your policies? Do you feel effectively represented by that person? And this is where we are. This is where we are, and it's, this is going to be um, something that I talk about a little bit later. So I'm going to make a second assertion, which is that diversity of thought is good for innovation and change. So. Fran Johansson sets me up for this talk because he's of, I think, Swedish descent, has you know, a black parent and a white parent, basically somewhere in Europe where there are essentially no, really an island, he's like an island all to himself. He's like, my sister and I basically represent the black population of Sweden. And, you know, and he wrote a book called The Medici Effect, and it's a great book, but what it talks about is how if you have, an, I mean, when I really look at it, this room, I'm really like, we're doing the right thing for the future. Right, you know, you look around and it's like it's not homogeneous. You see diversity here, and I think that that's wonderful. But when you have diversity at the table, that's when your thoughts start to change, right? So, there was a very, very famous architect, and they asked the famous architect, "Can you build a mall in Africa? I can't remember the country that has no AC." Okay, sir, no, I can't do that. But what the architect did, and this is probably why he's famous, is he didn't ask another architect what to do. He didn't go and say, OK, well, are there any other malls somewhere really hot that don't have AC? He asked a termite ecologist, how do I, termites basically live in a mole, right? They live in a mole hill. And they have to maintain that hill at a perfect temperature that varies very little in degrees. He basically asked a termite, termite ecologist, how do I build a mall with no AC? 
how do the termites do it? I mean, I would never think, okay, and this is why I'm not an architect and also not in that Institute of Medicine. I would never think, oh, I'm going to build a mall. What I need is a termite ecologist. No. One, because I don't know anything about termites. So before I read this book, I didn't know anything about this. And two, because you're not per se thinking outside of your silo, right, that you existed. And I'm arguing that this mall got built and it's perfectly cool without any AC because he thought about bringing somebody to the table that was completely unexpected. So let's get back to the idea of the state and the citizen. The 114th Congress, we're in the 116th Congress right now, but I thought it might be a little bit provocative to go back a, you know, a little bit, you know, a couple years. Um, this is the gender composition, and this is the racial composition. I would suggest you're not being represented by your state. 80% male, 80% white. Like that is our representation. In 30 years, there's no racial majority. There's already no gender majority. I mean, just by statistics, right? And this is your state. Are your policies represented? And are you doing? Maybe what your dissatisfaction in community and in the, you know, in the general population is, is because there's no motivation for the doers. How motivated do you feel right now as a citizen based on your state? That's what you need to ask yourself. Is your state right now, your policy makers, the people who decide what you do as an American citizen or anything else, are they representative of you, your thought process, what you think? Remember, politics is local. You guys are going to change the world. In your generation, there'll be no you and I. There'll be no others because everyone will be an other. So think about what that means, I think, for the future. So why does it matter who's at the table? You know, I think it fundamentally matters because policy moves the social needle. Policy is not just abstract. It's not just, OK, these are the rules, follow them, et cetera. And I'm just going to give you an example. You probably feel a certain visceral reaction to this. But this was just what it was in 1950 and 60. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, this is how we operated. This is what we did before there was desegregation in this country. For you, this probably has a visceral reaction, but this was the way that things were. You know, 300,000 people denied the right to vote. This was how it was before the, Vi the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I think what I really think is important is if we forget our history, we stand to regress and not progress. Okay, so if we forget, because there are people doing things, it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit nicer, gerrymandering, changing lines, trying to figure out what to do. But why are we so afraid of the citizen? Like, why are we so afraid of what the citizen has to say? Why is that so scary to us as a population? Why do we have to gerrymander? Why do we want lines to be just, you know, just so? Why do we have the electoral college? You know, think about being afraid of the citizen and what that means for the policy um, and how those things are affected. So you guys probably remember this guy. I'm kind of partial to him, uh, partly because he was able to come up with, you know, to kind of do something, an assertion in medicine that had been a Herculean effort pretty much since, like, the, you know, inception of Medicaid and Medicare, you know. And, and just to remind you, People think, oh, you know, they say about your generation, you're going to have no social security. I'm pretty sure that's right. But thank you for paying into the system in five to 10 years, because I would like some. Um, but when social security was new, people thought that this was crazy. Now people are appalled. And that's just to say our times are changing. What was needed 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago may not be needed today. So we need to keep in mind our populace, and we need to keep in mind our citizen. So the reason why I'm partial to him is because he realized that this was not going to be sustainable. 17% of our GDP going into health care is not sustainable. It was thought in 10 years this would certainly be over 20%. Now, mind you, I can show you something else, which I'm not going to show you, which is there are countries like Cuba who spend pennies on our dollar and have the exact same survival as us. Cuba's, Cuba's biggest export in the world, doctors. When people say the Cubans are coming, there are countries around the world rejoicing because they know they are going to get the very best health care in the world. Doctors you know, from the US go to wherever go to Botswana, 
and they like, there's no CT machine? I mean, they're just confused, and trust me, I know, I've been there. Um, you know, I, you know, so just think about the fact that the Affordable Care Act was, for some people, this was like a non-starter. People were appalled at the fact that we were gonna say, 40 million people in our country are not insured, and we think it's probably reasonable to kind of distribute care or come up with a policy that makes sure that people can actually get basic care. Breast exams, hypertension, cholesterol, these basic principles are taken care of. So that people also don't use the emergency room at an exponential cost to all of us, okay? But people were really, uh, people were really kind of you know, dismayed by this. So I get back to this, and I think, I don't know what you all's politics is, but if we just take something as basic as health care and the Affordable Care Act, my argument would be that if we concentrate on the citizen and the state is able to maintain law and order, civility, financial security, and sovereignty, why is that so disgusting? Why, are, why am I so devastated by the idea that everyone would get some basic health care in a country that is essentially the richest country in the world? To me, it kind of seems reasonable. And I think that's why I say, let's focus on the citizen. Let's focus on the doer. Because then I think that that distills arguments down, maybe oversimplified. And maybe people would even argue that the financial security piece is at risk. But the truth is, we're trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and the national debt is just rising, right? So again, let's focus on the citizen. So I'm going to end by saying that's like, you know, the fastest 25 to 30 minutes has ever passed for me. Um, so I originally thought when I took this vice chair of diversity job that diversity begets diversity. I was like, this is going to be hard. Pittsburgh is not the most diverse city in the country, if that's news to you all. But it turns out that in my thinking that I changed my thoughts to that inclusive environments get di beget diversity. You don't have to be somewhere where everyone looks different, but if you feel welcome, that is a Herculean effort, basically, that you overcome, and it, it's, a, it's a real thing. So this really, I think, is the key. So when we think about these things, I think that we have to think about these things very, very importantly. The reason for this partly goes back to medicine again, which is where my foundation, and in the Harvard Gazette, they wrote up what was essentially the United States' longing, longest aging study ever done. So JFK was part of this aging study when he entered Harvard as a freshman in the 1930s, okay? And he essentially, and what they were trying to figure out is they said, okay, what leads to longevity? Like, who wouldn't want that, right? We have like the discussion about telomeres, these caps on your chromosome and all this other stuff. Can you take some pills and that lengthen your telomeres and you get to live until you're 200, right? <laughs> all of this work was done and they took hundreds, probably thousands of people that were entering Harvard Medical School, the surrounding area, et cetera, and they looked. They were doing head circumference. They basically took socio-demographic data, all of these things. And do you know what led to longevity? Does anybody know about this study? Relationships. Quality of life. Yeah, so, so the quality of life is really the issue, right? If you have long-standing relationships, if you're married and you have a good marriage, if you have good surrounding social networks, et cetera, that's what leads to longevity. So what I suggest is that this doesn't have anything to really do, I think, about longevity of life. It just has to do with longevity of everything that we talk about. The longevity of life, the longevity in you know, general health, the longevity of public policy, something that's a good idea, something that's based on good foundations, something that's based and surrounded on the citizen will stand for a long period of time. We all think it's very reasonable, like the, you know, Desegregation, 70 years. I think that that's longstanding. Our, you know, our founding fathers, that's just good medicine, right? Good policy is good medicine. Good policy is good for the citizen. It doesn't run from what it has, but what it must be, and that's something I'm going to argue with you looking out at the population, is it must be representative because you won't feel as though as a doer, as the citizen, that you want to do what people are telling you to do if it's not representative um, of who you are. So I love this hashtag, um, and it's kind of my last slide, but the hashtag is, you know, great minds think differently. We always say great minds think alike. So um, thank you for having me. I'm very excited about having a discussion with you guys for the next 30 minutes and see what you think about this idea of state and citizen. So thank you. I know you guys are quiet, so don't make this painful for me. <laughs> 
What about the state and citizen, um, state and citizen concept? Do you guys believe it? Do you feel like there's some there's some substance there? Well, I mean, I it's completely made up. <laughs> um, but I think you know, as a citizen, it, it kind of resonated with me. And you guys are going to be the future policymakers of the world. So. So in this age of patient-centric medicine, we hear a lot about you know physician medicine, patient-centered care. Do you see this idea of state and citizen? being addressed in that context? I do, because I think, I mean, everything that I do, and I think the reason I think you bring up a great point is because if you're the, you know, everything that I do is pay, essentially patient-centric, right? Why do I want to try three immunotherapies that basically cost your insurance company $2 million over a three-year period of time if I could know what your genetic makeup is and, and essentially treat you based on that? I mean, that's where we're going, right? Immunotherapy is this idea that I can get your own immune system to fight off cancer better than I give you something that kills your cancer cells but also kills all the other cells in your body, right? So again, I think it gets back to this point of do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Yes, chemotherapy does kill cancer. It does also kill all your healthy cells, you know, kills a lot of your healthy cells off too. So I think we are this state and citizen idea as long as we maintain some type of law and order. Now when you start to say patient-centered care, then you could go very far with that, right? You could start talking about human engineering. You could start to say, well, if I'm the patient and I'm having a child, well, why can't I just have a blue-eyed child versus a brown-eyed child? Why can't I have a child with this versus that? And I think then we start to lose our law order and we may start to erode on our civility. We're certainly going to start to erode, I think, on our financial security if we start basically creating medicine and essentially a menu um, for care. So. Thank you so much for coming oh, no, here. Um, and I do really think that your concept of state and citizen makes sense, especially if you look at it on a more micro level. So thinking about companies and leaderships of company, like you know, I know that my boss probably won't be a representation of me. <laughs> it's probably going to be um, you know older white male. Um, you know, look at CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. How many are women and how many are male? And that being said, just thinking about my experience at my old job, um, we started a diversity and inclusion initiative, mm -hmm. and so there were a lot of ideas. Um, at first, there was a lot of excitement that came out of it, but um, you know that that was where it ended. There wasn't much about implementing the ideas, or it, you know, it took it lost momentum, and so these ideas didn't become um, reality or realized. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how like companies on a on a more micro level, how representation and how you know getting things done, done. Mm -hmm. would be uh, would be useful. If you just had thoughts about you know how to make that happen. So I think the very first thing is that I always say you have to be intentional and you have to be programmatic. So if you don't go into a situation thinking, oh, I'm going to be intentional, I have a, a group of people, I may have you know, a Latina from Harvard, I may have a, you know, a white male from Dartmouth, I may, you know, whatever, and I may have someone else from, you know, you have to be intentional, you have to sometimes think, there were doors that were closed for a long period of time, what do I want the population that's sitting at the table look like? I think one thing that's very provocative about what you mentioned, and I didn't show it here, I actually took the slide out, is that Companies that are gender diverse make 15% more profit than companies who are, that are not. And companies that are th ethnically diverse make 35% more profit than companies that are not. So I think you have to talk about, I mean, if you really want to talk about it, you have to talk about it from the aspect of kind of what does your economic health look like? And companies, that will resonate with them, right? You're kind of like, okay, I don't have people at the table. If I'm a marketing company, why do I want to sit in a room with people who are completely homogenous when in 2050 the, the country's going to have no racial majority? You have to have representation, and I think that's the biggest thing. The other thing is I think environment is, is a big issue, and that's why I talk about these inclusive environments. I think you create an inclusive environment partly by welcoming people in. When people come, when they interview, they kind of say, oh, this place would represent me, but you got to get there first. It, you know, it may be all homogenous now, but how are you going to effectively change that? How are you going to sometimes make a decision of like, you know something, we don't, you know, we already have enough white males. It's, I think it's okay to say that. Like, it's not a country full of all white males, and I think it's okay to say that, right? If I had a zoo and there were only elephants, I wouldn't probably go, right? <laughs> I mean, somewhere that I'm coming to get a certain, right, yeah, I'm not coming to see the same thing every time, and company, companies need to be evolving. 
The other thing is I tell people all the time, and we say this at University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Medicine, I can sell anybody a bag of goods. I'm a pretty good salesperson, but if they come and they don't feel included, they don't feel like they personally are going to grow when they come to an institution, good luck keeping them there. So I can bring them there as a medical student. I can even bring them there as a resident. But if they don't feel included and they don't feel like anybody is breathing life into their situation, no one's going to take them under their wing, then they're going to have a problem staying there. And they're not going to want to stay there versus going to another institution where they can, they, they can actually feel that. So I think inclusive environments are important. Making decisions that are also sometimes difficult and but are intentional and programmatic are also important. And you are going to and that's going to make some people uncomfortable. But I think being uncomfortable is okay. I think it's okay to sit at a table and say, "Oh, look, you know, we have a list of applicants. Everyone that we're looking to hire looks the same, is the same gender and is of the same race. Do we feel okay with that?" And then we look at the country and we say, "What are we, you know, what are we doing here?" I think, it, you know, I'm the medical director of hepatology. I think if everybody that was, every physician that I hired was a black female, I think red flags would be raised. I'm not, I could be off the chart here, but I'm pretty sure people are like, something's wrong here. There are only 800 hepatologists in the country. So if I hire every black female that's a hepatologist, I would have hired half the black female hepatologists in the country. People would be kind of, you know, unsettled by that. If you twitch it around, people are not unsettled by the fact that I can go into a division and see people that all look the same, all the same gender, all the same race. Not that people are not disturbed one bit. And I think we have to think about those things. Um, do you see certain areas of medicine too where it is more homogenized? Because I guess I'm just—I mean, I know I'm just one person, but I've been—I've um, been going to UPMC for endocrinology treatment for over 20 years, and I actually have had only one doctor who was a white male. I've had all women of color for all of my other endocrinologists, which mm -hmm. I think, so I don't know too if you see certain segments of medicine where there are more people of color and yeah. more women of color yeah. and in other areas where it's Absolutely. Worse. I mean, I think people are, I mean, I think again, what resonates with people, mm -hmm. right? People, you know, black folks suffer more from hypertension, diabetes, the effects of that, some of the data that I share with you, de you know, basically right. getting amputation secondary to complications of diabetes. So I think people are more essentially drawn to those areas where they may have a family member that suffers from something, et cetera. So there are things that are highly male dominated, like the surgical subspecialty is still highly sub um, dominated. For example, I'm, my subspecialty is hepatology, but I'm trained in gastroenterology, highly male dominated. Um, you, you tend to see in the more procedural, interventional kind of, you know, to simplify, play with toys, <laughs> um, males, um, and then some of the things that require a, a lot more longitudinal care, caring, et cetera. There's also some data to suggest, and this is new data that came out when they looked at a million patients. And in medicine, we concentrate a lot on things like parameters of uh, quality, like readmission to the hospital within 30 days of being discharged and mortality. And women doctors tend to be have patients that have less mortality, have a lower mortality, and have less less 30-day readmission. And the question is, why is that? What are the best part of women that we can capitalize on that we somehow that somehow is clustering with gender? And it could be just right. The numbers are extremely large, um, but there's something there. The other thing is that you all may know that in 2019 it was the very first time that women outnumbered men in medical school. So the workforce is going to also look different in the next 25 to 25 years or so. What else, guys? I love it. Keep on going. If they don't want to have a conversation with me, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so technology is beginning to play a huge role in medicine. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the way that the Institute of Medicine came up with these first Mm -hmm. The hope had been that um, on the issues of health equity and, and diversity and so on, that uh, technology would actually be at the center of the But uh, what we are finding now is it's only as good as you know the data that's given, the people who make decisions, and 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 you know we hear now about you know so much about algorithm bias, and mm -hmm. so UPMC is a very technology centric uh, mm -hmm. environment. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how um, this is you know, really affecting your day-to-day -day use of the technology for patient care and um, its impact and, and, and where the... Um, the where the disconnect is? Yeah, disconnect as well as how to really start addressing that. And, 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 and really maybe, you know, see whether you know, we can use the potential. I mean, I think... For, 
I think a part of it, is, so I think there's going to be two, there's one thing, so which is education. So how many of you have taken the Harvard Implicit Bias Test before? Have any of you all taken it? Which is phenomenal. And I, I suggest that if you kind of want to know more about yourself, you should take it. So that's the first thing. There are implicit biases and there are also explicit biases. I, um, it really, really starts with education. One thing that we, we fundamentally educate people sometimes in medical school about these fundamental differences, right? So let's just take, for example, the fact that, you know, I may have sideburns growing down the side of my face as just part of, I mean, I, I don't, but my sister, who would get mistaken essentially for Iranian, people did not think that she was black. She's very hairy. She kind of had cyber. That's not her statism in her. That is just a norm, right? It's just a variant on the norm. When women present, for example, with heart attack, we know that women are less likely to say that they have the typical pains that a male, you know, it's kind of like man flu. Like a man's sick from a flu and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm falling out. I'm, you know, like, I mean, we have these concepts because people present differently, right, in these regards. A woman has a flu and she's kind of up for the next two days, still taking care of her kids until she just can't do it anymore. I mean, obviously, there's a bias there. Love you, men in the audience. And, I, and I'm married to one of you. Um, so I know these things are real. I'm not, I'm not making them up. Um, but we tell, you know, women don't present with chest pain in the same way they may be having an MI. Minorities don't present with chest pain. And we teach that in medical school. We say, when you see something, you've got to be very careful to not call what may be atypical. A woman may be saying, oh, I kind of have a discomfort. They're not saying I'm having chest pain that radiates into my, I'm having a discomfort, maybe a little bit of pressure. I, don't, I feel unwell. They're not saying, oh, I feel like I'm going to die. Um, and that, I think, is part of it. So education is part of it, dealing with the implicit bias. What I think in technology is going to have a huge role is exactly what you talked about before, before. Two things, um, the technological advances and artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is start, going to start to really, we're going to put basically information, we talked about this kind of AI, machine learning, et cetera, and from Watson or whatever, we are going to get some idea of what really is at the top of that differential. because. If we can't differentiate those things, we're going to continue to have this. We're going to be having the same conversation. We have major technological advances and still the same health disparities we have. We've had healthy people 2010, 2000, like every single decade we've had healthy something and we have not met those goals. I mean, we have some of the worst infant mortality in the entire world. And maternal mortality. And maternal mortality, right? So, and this is be and people have come out to say people don't believe that I'm telling the truth, right? I have gone, I've gone to hospitals myself and feel like people are kind of like blowing me off. And I'm not someone who wants to tell anybody when I walk into a hospital that I'm a physician. But sometimes you have to say, you know, all due respect, I know what I'm talking about. You know, I I I can tell you a story that I went to Again, respect to UPMC, I went to McGee Hospital. I was having blood pressure. I had already had preeclampsia and lost a previous child at 27 weeks. I went into McGee. I had a blood pressure at home of 180, which is 70 points above my systolic blood pressure. When I got there, it was 150. I had some swelling in my life. Mind you, I'd already had a previous event. And I'd also had a child with, um, that was premature with help, another eclamptic. And I went in there with my third pregnancy. And they were like, oh, we think you're fine. This is... A, and I had to say, all due respect, I'm a physician. I don't think I'm fine. I lost a child at 27 weeks. I had a premature child at 31 weeks with preeclampsia, and I want this to be taken seriously. Now, I've been a physician for 15 years. What if you, what if you just walking in off the street, and you're just a 23-year-old looking to have a healthy child, and they tell you to go home? I mean, I can tell you with my first child, they told me, you know, I said, something's wrong. I kind of feel like I slept. You know, I've never been pregnant before, first child. I was like, something's in the toilet. It looks, and I lost my mucus plug. Now I realized that in retrospect, but I've never been pregnant. Oh, just lay down. You're going to be fine. The next day I went, no heartbeat. So this is a real, these are real things that are happening to real people. And sometimes education does not effectually change the balance of those things. I can't deliver my own child. I have had other friends who are also physicians who have not been taken seriously delivered right in triage in McGee Hospital. Physicians. So we got to do better. There is a difference. We have to deal with our biases. I can just tell you, I know, I review applications for medical school, I review applications for residency and for fellowship, and I'm harder on women than I am on men. I know that. I often have to go back in my applications and say, wow, I just accepted this man for an interview and I don't know, I feel like the woman I just rejected might be a little bit stronger and I have to go back. 
And I think we have to ask ourselves time and time again, are we dealing with those implicit biases? And unless we know them, we can't deal with them. There are some explicit biases. Guess what? The Harvard Implicit Bias Test says, I like black people more than I like other people. Surprise, surprise. I can tell you, though, that when I took the test, I was afraid it wasn't going to say that. I mean, think about that. Think about how devastating that is to self if you, like, if you don't love yourself more than you love others. So we have to be concerned with these things because it's part of our formal education. You know, so I, th this is kind of, I think, where I am in regards to, I think artificial intelligence is going to have a role, where personalized medicine is going to have a role. And then I think our training in, re in regards to cultural competence, how we communicate with people, what when one person says what me may mean another thing, and how we do our due diligence in those situations is, and are we always going to be right? No. But that's, the, that's why there still is an art of medicine. The problem with that art is when you're implicitly biased and that art turns into death, morbidity, mortality. Sometimes it's okay to be wrong. Other times it's not. Yep. So going back to the workplace environment yes. and building that inclusive environment, yeah. um, do you have some examples of how you felt an uh, inclusive environment at UNC and how you got the buy-in of executives who may not see it as such an important because I'm asking because in my previous work experiences, um, usually the executives would like usher in a working group and give the employees the charge of creating that inclusive environment. But I find that it's not as effective as if it came from the executive leadership. Yeah. So I think that's the key. So the question really is, just to repeat it, what have I done at UPMC to kind of create that inclusion environment? So the first thing is that when I first took the job, I said, you know, if the person who's going to be my boss doesn't really believe in this, I'm good. Like, thanks, but no thanks. Because top-down leadership is clearly the issue. It is overly burdensome to citizens and societies and groups of people, particularly who are others. Now, mind you, other is not always the opposite of heterosexual, male, and white, right? There are just others in the population. And it is burdensome to them to constantly be charged with their own sense of inclusiveness. Like, it's like, oh, plan yourself a party. Well, that's not really that fun, you know? So it's really, really important to make sure that, one, the top-down leadership, and I think this is important to you all as you all go out in the world, is to say, what does the company that I'm going to work for stand for? I gave, a talk, I gave a talk at UPMC when I first accepted the job, and I showed the Google letters, but it didn't say Google. It was the letters, it was the, the colors and everything. But everybody knew it was the Google symbol, right? You know, because you know somewhere, you've never been inside Google, but you know someone's riding a unicycle, eating free sushi, <laughs> and basically playing on a bouncy ball somewhere, because that's what they do. That's what they're known for. So the question is, whenever you have a brand, what is the brand that you're going to take on known for? And all due respect to my employer, when we put up UPMC Life Changing Medicine, what does that fundamentally mean? For whom and by whom? You know, remember FUBU? You guys are too young for that. For you, by you. It's like people used to buy that stuff up. I'm like, yeah, for me, by me. Yeah, awesome. You know, so there's, there's a buy in there. And the question is who is the life changing medicine for, guys? I'm 100% certain, and this is how I sell it to UPMC because it's a medical institution. You know, all these people are, you know, Google's getting into medicine. Everybody's getting into medicine, right? So if I'm sitting in Pittsburgh and I can choose what my physician looks like, I can choose the gender, I can choose the race, I may be even at sexual orientation, and I'm just going to get on an app and I'm going to call that person up and get care from them. When I can do that, maybe I will not choose to get care here in Pittsburgh in a homogenous society of physicians, right? Maybe I'll choose to go to California. Maybe I'll choose to go to Baltimore, somewhere where people look more like me. So if you want to be effective in the marketplace at giving people what they want, what they feel comfortable with, then you have to think about what your product stands for. Who is it life-changing medicine for? And by whom is it life-changing medicine for? Because everything that I've presented here, and it's been brief and it's been short, but I can show you hours of data to suggest that change is more effectual when the state represents the citizen. So if you're not into that, you are not going to be big in medicine in 20 years. You're going to be behind the eight ball. And I've tried to convince people, and I think it's coming along. I think people start to realize, if I'm going to be a player in the game, I'm going to have to change. You know, There's a reason why in the NBA they don't play zone. It doesn't work. The athletes are too good. You have to go to man-to-man. -to -man. And if you don't want to do that, you're not going to be a player in the game. That's it. 
You know, so I think top down leadership is clear. Right. And then you have to ask yourself, what is your brand? What does your brand stand for? Because in 20 years, we're all going to be looking at holograms and choosing stuff. We're going to be the Jetsons, essentially. You're going to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and choose the brand that you want for many things, including medicine. And for you all, that may be very different if you can get somebody that looks like you, shares something like you, knows what you're talking about, you know. You know, sky's the limit. But I, what I'm saying is I think I've been hopefully pretty provocative at the highest levels about what diversity means and why it's important and why it's going to be even more important in 30 years than it is today. But if you don't listen today, you're going to be behind in 30 years. I feel like there's been a lot of mainstream coverage lately of health disparities in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and how it's a really good city for health care for a very specific group. Mm -hmm. But I recognize that even though we don't take the pain of certain populations as seriously as others, it's really hard to, to legislate that to enforce in a way that you have to treat everyone the same. So from our policy perspective as future legislators or consultants, what type of policies should we be writing or advocating for to bridge the health disparity gap? I mean, I think, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's probably going to end up coming down to numbers, right? And I, I think it's horrible that we have to do this in some ways, but I think there are going to have to start being report cards. You know, if you take care of a certain population of patients, right, and I, and I suggest that, wow, your disparate outcomes are way out there. Like, you're a cardiologist and you haven't recognized an MI in a, you know, in a female in the last 10 years, and people are dying at your hand, then, and that's going to start to be publicly available information, right? So I think we have to just ask ourselves, you, we're going to have to start asking ourselves, even when we're in that room with the patient, what might be different about this scenario than another scenario, right? Oh, let me remember that this may present differently in this population than this population. Um, and I think report card, you know, keeping people accountable are going to be, is going to be a real part of that in medicine. And I think that that's unfortunate because I think it takes a little bit of fun out of the art if you have to think about those things. But I do think that, remember, it's only going to take up those people who are kind of two and a half standard deviations from the mean. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody wants to be big brother and there's nothing that, uh, you know, a physician hates more than a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but I'll say that, you know, you, you do want to keep people accountable and there are people who have not just dealt with some of the basic you know, their basic implicit biases and their ability to kind of practice, I think, is being, is being uh, hindered by that. Thanks for sharing the story about your pregnancies. Um, I think a question of black maternal health, both in the country and in Pittsburgh, are fairly well established. Is there anything that UPMC is doing to uh, so other people don't have your experience and that there is a more systematic approach uh, to black maternal health care issues. So this is, you know, I don't know that UPMC has put out anything formal and people are, I think a lot of people who study health disparities and work in the diversity and inclusion space are looking for UPMT to put something out about that. Obviously I'm not coming to Carnegie Mellon to be, um, to say anything bad about my employer, but I think we're waiting to see what it is they feel like we can do because I think UPMC has um, the chance to really revolutionize how we take care of people um, in the country. It's a very, very unique situation of being a payer and provider, and we are the only academic institution in the country um, that really is both at this large level, ensures four million people both a payer and provider. So we have the ability to establish the goals and what we think the criteria for good care are, and I think we should be doing those. I think it gets back to the idea of what he asked, which is the report card issue of like policy to say, what do we think is not reasonable, and what do we do with these people who are outside of the dom domain of what we think normal survival, maternal survival, and fetal survival in, 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 um, in Pittsburgh um, should be. So I think it gets back to knowing what your data is, knowing whether you have anybody outside of the three, you know, two and a half standard deviations from the mean, and trying to figure out what you do about that and what is the, the reason. Or is it just, you know, is it an institutional, is it an institutional issue? Some people might suggest it's institutional racism or insti you know, it's kind of an institute thing. But I don't think anybody, and I say this all the time, nobody got into medicine to not be in the life-saving business. I mean, I just generally don't think 99.99% of us went through all of this, I mean, 
I, I must have gotten paid $40,000 for 15 years in a row. I mean, there are people, I remember my friend said she went back to her Yale uh, reunion and her boyfriend was complaining because he had gone to Goldman and he was a, you know, he's a millionaire. He's like 30 years old. He's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And she's like still in medical school <laughs> with like $300,000 debt. And she was like, I wish I could feel sorry for you. <laughs> um, so I think there's going to be some report card. I think we're going to have to deal with those people who are outside of the mean. And I think um, there's going to have to be some systematic, like we said, policy um, that, com that, that comes up with um, what we think is reasonable for care. I mean, this is a national issue, right? Yeah. I mean, when we look at the quality of care around the world, the United States is only high when you cross that on the, on the X and Y axis with cost. I mean, it's flat when it comes to quality because the quality is the same essentially throughout the world and the United States is just peaking out and far point um, to the left-hand side when it comes to cost. So we just have to figure out how to do what we do better. But I think we're all in the life-saving business, so I think that that should be, if we create some policies and some standards, that should be remediable. Anything else, guys? Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming and talking. Oh, um, so something I've been thinking a lot about recently is that um, you know, in Heinz, like as a Heinz student, Heinz College is located in a city where a majority of public school students are African American, um, and yet, if you look at the student body at Heinz and the uh, like, the, the faculty here, that's not really represented. That's it's a very very tiny percentage, um, and yet, like you know, Heinz College, you know, under your framework. It's kind of training us to become this. Way, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of a lot of people come from Heinz uh, into local government in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of like what is our responsibility as an institution um, with regards to everything you've been talking about, um, and uh, kind of how do we avoid sort of perpetuating this problem? Of, so there's two things that I think about. One is something that um, Warren Buffett said a long time ago, which he said um, is, if you want to not be part of public education, you should have to buy your way out of it. And I don't think that that's such a bad idea. And I'm somebody who does not send my children to the public school in Pittsburgh for exactly the reasons you talked about. I don't think my children are a social experiment. I went to public school. I went to a high school where probably 20% of people go to, go to college. Um, I was so scared I slipped my application to Johns Hopkins underneath my guidance counselor's door because I thought he would say you're you know this is a joke kid like you're never gonna leave this high school and go to you know a premier institution so I think that um, one is we should have to buy our way out of the system if you're privileged enough to not have to go to public school you should have to pay into the system above and beyond your taxes the second thing I think um, and I think that that's a little bit radical and it's my personal opinion right the other thing is I think we need to start educating people at these institutions. These five and six year old children that are minorities that are in the city, just as smart as all these kids that are in the north, just as smart as all these kids. But because it's not on their multiple choice, if I put up a question and I give you A through E, you're gonna pick something. You, most people that are five or six in the audience, even if say one plus two equals three, most kids are not gonna be brave enough to say, oh, the, the answer's not there, right? And most of these city kids don't have on their multiple choice, I can go to Heinz College, I can go to CMU, I can be a physician, because they don't see anybody around them that's doing that. I grew up in one of those communities, so I know. like. The people in my community that I grew up with are not doing anything significant. You know, they're still in that same community kind of doing their thing. And they're proud as can be if they see me on the street. But the second thing is I think we as educational institutions need to build educational institutions. Why not? Why can't Carnegie build, Mellon build a K through 12? Why can't UPMC take everybody that works in the cafeteria and build a K through 12? If you put all those cafeteria workers, all the people that are working in these in support staff, in a school K through 12 built by UPMC focusing on STEM, you have a medical school full of minorities in less than a decade and a half. I mean, that's revolutionary. All this other stuff, you're kind of chipping away over time. Institutions of higher learning, I think, do need to give back to the lower learning level. And if you want to fill the institution of higher learning, with a diverse population, then you have to know that early education is part of exactly what I talked about in my medical school thesis. The black-white achievement gap is real. It's not because blacks are inferior in any way, shape, or form. It's that early education is poor. If you have to change schools three times before you're in third grade, 
Think about the effect that that has. If you don't have food security, think about the effect of that. If you're going to school every single day hungry, I mean, I cook my children a warm meal every single day because I'm serious about like, I want you to go to school with your brain full of fat and hydrated, whatever. So, you know, if you end up being a dummy, you're just dummy fine. But at least I know I've supplied you with everything that you need in order to be successful, right? So, um, I just, you know, it's, I just think it's really, really important that we, that we give back. And when we have the ability to do those things. Somebody came to me the other day and they were, you know, the, the, um, the chair of medicine had introduced me to some underrepresented minorities who had graduated college. And one girl was just saying, I can't afford the MCAT. And you can't take the MCAT without a prep course. It's just, it just makes an uneven ground. So then you're right back, you're in the application pool, your score is not as good as everybody else, you know. So I'm just kind of like, this should be surmountable, right? I should be, I'm like, I'll pay for you to take an MCAT class, you know, but that's one person. You know, we got a big, we have these large institutions. We have people who are willing to give money and to name buildings and do all these things. What about a K through 12 school? How can we support that? Maybe it's even a charter, partly supported by, you know, our state government, our local, all these other things. But we got to think of a way out of this situation where we don't fundamentally care about public school education because the people who have are able to basically get out of the system. And that's the issue. We're cre and we're creating a wider chasm between the have and have nots, right? Some people will escape. I will go from being in the bottom fifth percentile to being in the top fifth percentile based on what my parents earned. You know, my son has no clue. My son, I drove him home the other day. He's like, are we poor? I said, our garage is the size of the house I grew up in. I grew up in a house that was less than 700 square feet with five other people. And you know, you know, you know nothing of that, right? But that's one family getting away. That's two families getting away. How do we create, you know, I couldn't, I will tell you, you know, the things that bother me is that I'm in a city, for example, and we went to see the Phipps Lights, for example. We go around, da, 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 da. I didn't see any black people until I went to the cafeteria. Pittsburgh is 26% black. You wouldn't know that, per se, walking around the city because there's these small pockets, right? I don't send my, I didn't send my child to public school. I live in Squirrel Hill. But the thought is that, right, everyone's going to presume when my son walks to the front door that he grew up in Homestead, not in Squirrel Hill, right? I mean, my partner asked me, why do you live in Squirrel Hill? You're not Jewish. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> I, say, I, to that. I might be Jewish. <laughs> you know? But so, and, and that's fine because I think we have, and I, the other thing is I think, you know, and this brings up a point, we have to have a conversation about race in this country. We can't just keep on, like, acting like it doesn't exist. People will say things like, I'm colorblind. That's ignorant. <laughs> like, no, you're not. You don't know that I'm brown when I walk in the room? That's crazy. But the irony of that is that I don't want you to be colorblind. I want you to know that I'm black when I walk in the room. I want you to know that I'm a female. I just want you to have no suppositions about what that means when you see me. Because you don't know anything about me, right? So I just think that we have to be more free in our conversations. We have to be more loving. You know, I think about there are things that I don't understand. I may be in a diversity and inclusion environment, but there are things that I don't understand. But what I think about is the fact that Less than, you know, a hundred years ago, somebody thought I was two-thirds of a human. Let me just consider in the things that I don't understand, that I may not understand it, and I'm trying to learn, right? I'm trying to open my mind to what is other or what is different. I don't represent all that is minority in this country, all that is other in this country, but let me open my mind to some of these things that I didn't grow up with that I don't know. Um, you know, so these are real, you know, these are just real conversations that we have to have and we're going to have to have with our children. My son came to me the other day, how do you know Noelle, which is my three-year-old daughter, wants to be a she? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm, you know, and she may not. But she, when, and when she expresses that to me, I'm not going to assert that on her, right? But I don't know. But this is a seven-year-old already asking me these questions, right? And I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Um, but I've been through enough stuff. I've been, you know, seeing my lesbian sister closeted for 25 years, not being able to come, you know, open to her black immigrant parents who, you know, we listened to things when we were kids that talked about, you know, crazy stuff like killing homosexuals. That's, I mean, that was part of reggae music where you would just say, so, but we've come full circle, right? And, and she's out and she's married and she, you know, she, you know, she's enjoying her life, but doing so, and doing so with the understanding of her parents now. You know, so we can change. 
and we as the state, and we're, you know, the state sometimes is parents, sometimes are you all, sometimes is the state government, the federal government, but we have to be willing to evolve with the times in some ways. That doesn't mean we leave what we believe fundamentally, but it believes we, we know that 50 years ago, what we thought was bigotry might be our bigoted thoughts today, right? I can think that if I'm closed-minded, that may be bigotry in and of itself, and I was part, once part of the population who's essentially being made to feel that, feel that way. So, last question. So when you were saying about the implicit biases, yes. it's implicit because we don't know. Probably there are some people who know that they are biased yes. and they want to continue Correct. doing that. So how do you get them into conversation where like, whenever this conversation happens, it's just a set of people who care about the cause and who see that there's value in it, who engage in it. How, how do you bring people who are biased and who don't want to get into the conversation into it? Because they are also the decision makers who will bring in the change. You know, I don't think, um, you know, fundamentally, like I'm a Christian person, and I believe, you know, I have to go back to bi biblical principles on this one, which is you can't witness to a closed heart people have to feel like they want to hear something, right? They want to have their mind changed at some point. I don't think that that's where your strength lies. Your strength lies in saying open, being loving. People, people will see something in you. They'll say, wow, I have a structure in my mind and I feel like this person fits into this such, you know, social or structural context that I have in my mind and you'll break that mold for them. And that's the biggest action that you have. It's when you see those people that are on the line that are contemplative or pre-contemplative and you feel like, they, they want me to change their mind. They want me to bring up something that might be something that they've never heard before. And I think that's where our power as citizens in society really are. Those people who are completely shut off, you know, hearing the noise of their own voice in an isolated room in the dark, I, I don't feel like that's where most of our power is going to be. Um, and I feel as though as we shift and we go more towards what we once thought was disgusting and we, you know, what we once, or what we once thought was okay, then gradually society as a whole pulls those people along because they'll say that's not acceptable behavior. That's three standard deviations from the norm in regards to our social construct. So thanks guys for having me. <laughs>